Virtually all neurologists believe MS is an autoimmune disease. So let's talk about the immune system. The immune system protects the body against germs, basically bacteria and viruses. There's two parts of the immune system, the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is the first stage of defense. It has its own set of cells. The most common cell is, uh, they're all called leukocytes. The most uh, abundant leukocyte is called a neutrophil. 60 to 70 percent of leukocytes are neutrophils. And there are several other cells, basal, basophils, eosinophils, mast cells, dendritic cells, and remember this one, macrophages. Macrophages, and to some extent the neutrophils, are the leeches and maggots of the immune system. They basically, their job is to eat uh, dead and dying tissue. The, the second stage of the immune system, the adaptive immune system, uh, is comp comprised of lymphocytes, and there are two types of lymphocytes, B cells and T cells. B cells make antibodies, T cells have two types. There are helper T cells and killer T cells. In the case of MS, thanks to MRI, we now know a lot more about what happens at the very beginning. Historically, we only could look at what's happening in the brain after the person had died, often 20, 30 years after uh, they had developed MS. But because of MRI, we're now able to see what's happening in the brain hours or days after an acute attack. And what do we see? We see what's called the gadolinium enhancing lesion. Gadolinium is a small molecule that normally cannot get into the brain. Uh, so when it's injected intravenously, normally it just stays in the blood supply. But during an acute uh, attack of MS, within hours or days of an acute attack, the gadolinium gets out of the vein, the tiny veins and venules in the white matter of the brain, and they leak into the surrounding tissue. So we now know what happens acutely. If we have, if we're able to look at the brain under the microscope, and this has been very difficult uh, because you don't get to look at someone's brain under a microscope until they've died, with some exceptions. Uh, but we do have some studies, primarily the work of Prinius and Barnett, uh, where we can see what, a, what an actual uh, lesion looks like in the brain, where, where you, the gadolinium lesion on MRI is seen. So what do you see? You see macrophages engulfing myelin. Macrophages are, are eating little bits of myelin that are uh, in the tissue around a venule or a tiny vein. Uh, you, you see some lymphocytes, but the lymphocytes are around the venule. They're what's called perivascular cuffing. The lymphocytes are around the venule. They are not, uh, the, the macrophage are eating the, the dead myelin. So the, the theory has always been that those, those white cells were attacking myelin. But in fact, there is no evidence that they're directly attacking myelin. The, evidence, the, the, the histology, the microscopic evidence is they're cleaning up the myelin. The, uh, the helper cells and the T cells are helping orchestrate that process, but there's no evidence that they're directly attacking myelin. Some of the T cells in the bloodstream and spinal fluid will show a, uh, a reactivity to myelin. In fact, not actually myelin. Myelin is a lipid, so you don't have an immune response to lipids or carbohydrates. You can only have an immune response to uh, protein. So you can show that the proteins associated with myelin, they're called myelin proteins or myelin basic protein. You can show that the T cells in the bloodstream uh, are somewhat sensitized to the, uh, to the myelin basic proteins, but that's not surprising. Once the, once the attack has occurred, once myelin is broken down, 
then of course the, 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 the damaged myelin proteins are going to be perceived by the immune system as being damaged. And so of course those uh, T cells are going to be somewhat reactive to the damaged uh, myelin protein. But there's no evidence that they're attacking the myelin proteins, only that they're being sensitized by the fact that these myelin proteins are, are damaged and are broken down. So if, if there is no evidence after 50 years that there's a direct attack on myelin or its proteins by the T cells, then uh, what is going on? Well, the obvious answer is that the myelin is breaking down in the first place. That it's not that the uh, immune system is attacking myelin, but that the myelin is breaking down and the immune system, in particular the macrophages, remember the macrophages are part of the innate system. They're not part of the T-cell uh, adaptive immune system. They're coming in to do what they're supposed to do. They're coming in to be leeches and maggots, cleaning up the, the mess uh, led by, by, the, uh, by the shedding of the myelin. So our, our sh we should shift our thinking from looking for that to looking for why is the myelin breaking down in the first place? Uh, and the obvious answer is, that the oligodendrocytes, the cells that make myelin, uh, are being damaged because they're weakened, the myelin is falling apart. And so then of course, and that's what uh, Barnett and Prinius showed. They showed that the oligodendrocyte uh, damage actually precedes, comes before uh, the attack, the, the, the macrophage uh, cleanup phase. So then of course it just shifts the question back one stage to why are the oligodendrocytes dying? And so then there have been different theories about that. Uh, could it be nitric oxide, which is known to be toxic to uh, oligodendrocytes? Could it be iron? Uh, but still we have to ask, well, what's the problem? And so the most sensible uh, theory that I think uh, is available to us is that there's stagnation, that the oligodendrocytes are in a, in a stagnant environment, and that's why they're being exposed to waste products such as glutamate that are damaging them. So then we have to back up one stage further. What's causing the stagnation? So Edward, uh, Eduardo uh, Reinflesch in 1863 first proposed that the problem was a vascular one. Paolo Zamboni in 2006 reinvigorated that idea that perhaps the stagnation, the damage to the oligodendrocytes uh, is being caused by insufficient uh, drainage uh, uh, from the brain. So that would suggest that we should shift our research strategy to looking for what's causing the oligodendrocytes to die, what's causing stagnation, what's causing, uh, how do we measure venous drainage. Uh, the traditional complaint, uh, the, the complaint by the neurologist has been, well geez, veins are very variable. How do you tell a normal uh, venous drainage from an abnormal? Uh, there's been uh, all this literature about using Doppler or MR venography, and uh, there's a general agreement that these tests are, have quite variable responses. So at this point, we don't really know the best way to uh, measure abnormal uh, venous drainage. Uh, and then the next stage is that neurologists are already uh, looking, uh, ruling out uh, uh, cancers when they uh, have a patient with possible MS. They rule out infections of all different kinds. They rule out uh, blood abnormalities, coagulation abnormalities as part of the workup. Basically, I think they should also be ruling out uh, venous insufficiency problems. Yes, there's, there's, there's issues about what's the best way to do that, but that should be part of the, uh, of the list of things that are ruled out when someone is uh, trying to make a diagnosis of MS. And then finally, in terms of treatment, if someone has severe obstruction of their veins and they have symptoms, now we can argue about what symptoms would be the most important, we can argue about what is the definition of severe obstruction, but I think at this point part of the option for treatments uh, should be that if someone does have severe obstruction and does have uh, clinical symptoms that they should be uh, considered for venoplasty.